There's a scene in Death Stranding that director Hideo Kojima said during the game's recent demo at Tokyo Game Show would make you cry. It was when Sam was coming over the hill to Port Knot City. After working his way up on the character's bike, Kojima implored players to dismount as they crest the mountain top so they could take the rest of the journey on foot, absorbing the full splendour of the vista before them. He didn't want you rushing through it, he wanted you experiencing it as intended, soundtracked by that particular kind of soft vocal, melancholy pop carefully curated to make you feel like you were in some indie movie trailer, matching the feeling of being a lone delivery man dwarfed by the sheer vast of nature in the post-apocalypse, all of it culminating in players having no choice but to shed a tear. For me, this moment was preceded by 10 minutes of driving my crappy trike across land it wasn't designed to traverse, losing all my cargo as I got caught by BTs, beating a super simplistic boss through the rather tiring process of bombarding it with my excrement and blood, enduring the rigmarole of putting all my cargo back on my suit while tripping and breaking a bunch of it, then finally getting to the top of that hill to see the vista Kojima so wanted me to luxuriate in, only for my trike to fly off a cliff and explode, leaving my tar-covered Norman Reedus to soothe a wailing baby as I trudged my comically difficult to control tower of stuff down to the destination for five minutes, all soundtracked by that same song that appeared so carefully placed in the TGS showing, and in that moment, all I could do was laugh. The irony that this was meant to be some big emotional set piece reliant on so many elements working in tandem, only to have every single part of it awkwardly stumble into complete failure was hilarious, even if I was laughing with my head placed firmly in my hands. It felt like a cruel cosmic joke, one of many that would only grow in intensity as the game went on, to the point that Death Stranding to me is as much a comedy game as it is an absurdist exploration of isolation and loneliness. It's untitled goose game except the players are the villagers and the world is the goose, at every turn finding all new ways to toy with you within the minute details of its ridiculous wealth of systems. And like the villagers in goose game, no matter how close the game comes to breaking you, you can't quite bring yourself to wring its neck or in Death Stranding's case, stop playing. Hell, you maybe take some solace in the fact that at least this monolithic entity is affecting most people in much the same way, that you're not the sole punchline of the joke, and that whatever hardship you're going through right now, it might just lighten the load of someone else, however momentarily. But for me, that hardship still proved a lot to deal with, as the meditative experience I anticipated in the trailers morphed into one of the most complicated, punishing games about walking ever made. It's not hard as much as it's deliberately tedious. I didn't really have time to take in the scenery across the tens of hours it took me to complete the game. The peak of a mountain didn't represent that Skyrim or Breath of the Wild-esque challenge to overcome as much as it became an obstacle to avoid. I was too busy monitoring quickly draining meters and taking care of Bibi, constantly choosing between travelling light and worrying that I'd left myself ill prepared for what lay ahead, or fully suiting up and taking the hit to balance, speed and stamina. Whatever I chose, I was treating every step taken as if walking were a constant Tony Hawk grind, all while the game gradually introduced new hazards to make that load I was transporting feel all the heavier. All of this is to say my feelings on this game are complicated. I will say that Kojima has finally found a way of avoiding that problem of the dominant strategy that so often emerged in his prior games, in the form of the Trank Pistol for example, but only in the sense that every option you pick here features as many drawbacks as positives. The sight of the floating carrier in your resource menu might fill you with glee as you hurriedly dump everything you have on them, only to realise that any obstacle requiring a ladder or rope now comes with the added chance of sending your goods tumbling into the void below you. No problem you might think as you make use of the vehicles that become available, only for the game to immediately send you across landscapes that seem nigh impossible to cross with these trikes and trucks that somehow handle worse than the vehicles in the Phantom Pain. And whatever option you choose, especially as the game starts introducing more hazardous environments with harsher terrain, steeper climbs, blizzards, etc., you may find yourself internalising a mantra about anything designed to help you in this world. The more cargo you can carry, the more you stand to lose. Multiple occasions saw me in utter dismay, walking away from an entire distribution centre's worth of materials almost empty-handed because my vehicle got stuck in between two rocks and the jump functionality did nothing, or at the very least it sent me on another fetch quest within a fetch quest to find another vehicle, drive it to my old one and transfer all the cargo between the two, and in the upwards of half an hour that process would sometimes take, I would frequently wonder why I was even bothering as I pictured what repetitive holidays 
telegram chatter awaited me at my destination that eventually I came to dread as much as the trek itself. See, for as wacky as its world may seem, as well realised as its visual aesthetic is, Death Stranding by Kojima standards is a fairly dour, somewhat understated experience compared to the outward camp and theatricality of his prior work. In the Metal Gear series, you often began with a standard extract this target objective within a similarly standard military framework before exploding into a glorious anime mess of mechs and shady conspiracies and vampires and bugmen and whatever else to elevate this world to something more grandiose. Death Stranding, on the other hand, starts at that point of weirdness before giving way to, dare I say it, a fairly simple plot of walking from coast to coast. The apocalypse has happened, the world as we know it has fallen apart, and while the world that Kojima envisioned to rise from its ashes is almost comically dense, these characters now treat its details as mundane, routine, and outside of maybe the last couple of hours, what spawns from that is a lot of people rigidly spouting jargon-heavy exposition at you and telling you how good you are at delivering things. It might be the most complicated, sometimes visually stunning game about walking ever made, but it's still largely a game about walking, which to be clear isn't a problem in itself. It's like Kojima took the first hour or so of No Man's Sky, in which your equipment is all terrible and broken, and you're frantically traversing an incredibly hostile environment looking for resources before you keel over, but instead of the payoff of being able to freely explore the cosmos for your troubles, that initial scenario is just the entire game. For every mountain you navigate, you're presented with another, more treacherous mountain. For every light narrative hook you might want to pursue, you're first tasked with heading all the way back across the map to do some quests for a guy who really wants to tell you about the shape of his heart in detail while you sit in silence. All of which begs the question, why subject yourself to this? What are you actually getting out of this experience? Well, while what I've said so far might sound pretty negative, I think there is method to this madness. And as much as the plot itself might seem rather simple for a Kojima game, I think to write it off like some have done as the dude simply taking 40 hours to say social media bad is more than a little reductive. Yes, this is a game about social media and the metaphors can be pretty heavy handed in that regard, but I also think it's a game about the vast web of complexities that make up modern life. Political, professional, social, artistic, technological, and how isolating and powerless you can feel in the face of such complexity. It's about the weight of the world being placed on every individual's shoulders and everyone coming to different conclusions about what to do with it, all while the world in question continues to move far beyond their understanding. In a way that seems almost uncomfortably autobiographical given Kojima's recent history, it's also about defining legacy when everything you've worked for is taken away from you. Proof of the afterlife, your own extinction, these are all things characters confront in the wake of one apocalypse and the face of another. And in the game world, like ours, you understandably have a lot of people looking at this stuff, seeing how insignificant they and their actions are, and questioning the point of going on. How can this possibly get better? Fortunately, Kojima has found a surprisingly effective way to represent this existential crisis through gameplay, no matter how toilsome said gameplay may appear. And to explain, we have to get a little philosophical and indeed spoilery for a minute. In The Myth of Sisyphus, French philosopher Albert Camus posited that the question of suicide is the only actually important philosophical question. When the absurdity of the world feels so overwhelming and unknowable and your place in it unimportant, shouldn't you just kill yourself? As per the nihilist mindset, Set, is that not the only action you could take that would hold any weight? Camus argued, rightly I believe, absolutely not. He famously said of Sisyphus, fated by the gods to roll that same rock up the same hill time and time again for eternity, that he could only imagine Sisyphus happy. Sisyphus is aware of the futility in his struggle, and in this awareness, he ascends above any plan. He creates his own sense of meaning in that rock, in that labour. That is his world, and getting to the top of the hill is his purpose. There is a moment of satisfaction, however brief, as he reaches the peak, even if this largely pointless act only gives way to more struggle. Life may be meaningless in a cosmic sense, there may be no grand plan, but mankind is still able to live a rich life defined as they see fit. With that in mind, Sam Bridges may be the archetypical absurd hero, called upon to carry that cargo up that hill, and when he gets to the top, his reward is being told to go right back down so he can climb another. He rejects the wider notion of making America whole, barked at him constantly from above, and yet he just keeps going again and again as long as the player does, because there is meaning in 
inherent to that struggle. The reward is conquering that mountain. Along the way, he butts heads against more outwardly nihilistic forces that believe, as the world is destined to end, better to bring it about sooner rather than going on, pretending as if there is some grand purpose beyond inevitable extinction. Sam is given the, albeit false, choice to end it all with Amelie on the beach, and instead he puts the gun away and embraces her, deciding that existence is better than no existence, however difficult or temporary it might be. And like Camus could only imagine Sisyphus happy, this game basically culminates by straight up telling you that the way to feel content in this chaotic world is to take things one day at a time, appreciate the little victories, be there for those who need it. When the world is falling apart, focus on what good you can do for those close to you. If we all take this approach, we can maybe achieve more collective good than we might think. That is arguably the meaning of this endeavour. And while the first ending sequence is pretty visually explosive, taken as part of the game's larger whole, it might feel a little anticlimactic to get here and be told, yeah, none of this really matters and you may just be prolonging the inevitable, but keep going anyway. That said, there was something nice about such a simple conclusion given how it contextualised a lot of the work it took to get there. It made me look back on that slog in a slightly different light, realising that as frustrating as it can be to get halfway to your destination only to trip up and break a valuable package, or have your truck fly into a ravine sending your entire inventory along with it, it's only by raising the stakes of otherwise mundane activities that you can make achieving those simple goals feel meaningful in some way. For example, this is a game that makes running down a hill unscathed feel like a real intense challenge. Most games treat any kind of traversal as if you were moving across a flat, horizontal surface, but have you ever actually tried running down a steep hill, like sprinting down one as a kid maybe? You build a terrifying amount of momentum and the slightest misstep, an errant bit of moss will send you tumbling as if you'd just stepped on a banana peel. It's legitimately quite dangerous, it's a thrill, it seems like the tiniest thing, but I don't think any game has really captured that latent but omnipresent sense of danger lurking in the natural world quite like Death stranding. As a result, getting to the bottom of that hill feels pretty damn good in a way that it wouldn't if you didn't have to work for it. Similarly, it's stuff like this that made me grow to appreciate how clever the design of these levels actually is. It's a testament to the game's visuals that the landscape can look as if it was simply lifted straight from a photograph or real world geographic data. Look closer, however, and you begin to notice that a mountain that may seem insurmountable will almost always have little nooks and crannies that are just the right fit for a Ladder, turning these rock faces into incredibly tense, intricate puzzles, rewarding those that manage to anticipate the balance required between preparedness and packing light. And if you didn't, there is always another way around, it just might take a little searching to find it and a little longer to navigate. And even if you look upon the obstacles before you with absolute dread, all it means is that when you come across the inevitable rope or vehicle left by someone else thanks to the game's community features, the sense of relief feels all the more palpable. I'd be lying if I said it wasn't pretty heartening to see the game world evolve in this regard since launch, with the barren landscape gradually filling up with fluorescent lights as players construct bridges over previously vast chasms, and the oh-so-glorious safe houses begin to pop up more frequently. Many players might have been thinking purely selfishly when placing such objects in the environment, thinking how much time it could save them, but the cumulative effect is one where new players coming in, after going through an area once and connecting it to their instance of the chiral network, might legitimately have a less hostile experience going back the way they came to those that got into the game early. The community stuff in particular speaks to Kojima's funny kind of optimism you saw back in The Phantom Pain, where his career-long obsession with expounding the dangers of nuclear weapons weapons was taken to the next level. He put players to the test as he had a secret cutscene to be unlocked when all players on any given platform decided that instead of developing nukes for their individual mother bases, they would come together and disarm all of them. And lo and behold, this cutscene actually ended up playing on the PC version. But as some people theorised, this only happened thanks to a glitch where the almost incalculable number of nukes being created, likely through cheats, somehow managed to roll the counter over to zero. It was an interesting interesting idea on the part of Kojima, but one that proved untenable. It required players to individually hold themselves back from, or even undo a feature of their game world that they would have worked hard to achieve, and what's more, they had no control over how the rest of the world would act. 
Death Stranding is a similar test, it just works the other way, instead encouraging players to actively engage with its systems, simply applying the individual benefits across potentially an entire community. With the Phantom Pain's nukes, Kojima hoped for near instantaneous, worldwide, borderline systemic change in the way games and the wider internet work. Upon realising that there's not really any chance for everyone to get on the same page, and that if a few people can mess it up for the rest, they will mess it up, it seems as if he came to the conclusion that it's down to individuals to essentially be the good they want to see in the world, even if the change you might enact as a player appears insignificant or you might never see the benefit of your actions. The things that help you might help others, and that's reason enough to keep trying in the face of such bleakness. And when you break it down like that, it's kind of powerful to consider that Kojima has finally managed to realise his existential musings in the form of gameplay, even if it came at the price of making a game that was actually fun to play. Because while there's been a lot of talk about when it is exactly that Death Stranding becomes quote unquote fun, I can't say I actually enjoyed myself to any real degree until after I'd beaten the story and I could go about building roads purely on my own terms. See, for me, the problems start to arise with the game when I question just how deliberate some of its more tedious design choices might be, that point where a feature crosses from an artistic choice to a half-baked system, perhaps the biggest example being the game's action and stealth sequences. Given the desire Kojima expressed in the run-up to release to move away from traditional action game mechanics and violent tools like guns, as well as his insistence that there were no game over screens, I was quite excited for an experience that would shift away from combat, but make no mistake, that claim about game over screens is nonsense. Even if you are particularly rigid with your definitions, you can find yourself stuck with a straight up failure state requiring you to load a checkpoint. The combat is in there too, it's as wildly systems rich as the walking in fact, given the amount of options you have for taking cargo off your back and swinging it or throwing it or dodging or whatever else. It's also the one area in the game where you could argue there was a true dominant strategy, just hammer on square, or better yet, shoot them. Combat then ends up decidedly basic, where groups of enemies seem reticent to attack you as you take them down one by one. The stealth sections against the BTs don't fare any better as they start off every irritating then quickly transition to absolutely trivial, as you initially fumble against enemies you can't see, then eventually find yourself bombarding them with grenades or slicing your way through countless umbilical cords. When you get caught, you flounder with the game's awkward animations that really don't suit themselves well to this kind of action, where you're constantly having to move between buildings to gain the high ground. The enemies are slow, but you're clumsy. It all amounts to a situation where the core of both the stealth and action segments isn't really Really that much different from other open world stealth action games, where you sneak up on people and take them down or you drain the health bar of a stronger enemy, it's just that every element is far, far more protracted. Both the mules and the BTs are more irritating than challenging, every section involving them interrupting what is already a very tense, high stakes traversal system with mere busy work. Combined with the dangers of dead bodies as established in the story, the daft scenario occurs where it is still possible to kill people, but clearly Kojima and team didn't want to be so hostile to players that every encounter ended with a pile of bodies you then had to chuck into an incinerator, so ploughing into a group of people with a truck at full speed for example is likely to just leave them uh, unconscious. In all, the fundamentals of the game's action are still pretty violent, it's just Kojima read a Kobo Abe story and changed choke them out with a rope to connect them with a strand. The walking simulator at the game's core would have been enough, at least for me, it's just now the game has yet another means of grinding players down through sheer tedium. After a certain point, the worst part about the BTs becomes the lengthy, unskippable animation that plays when your Audra deck unfolds. It's like, we get it Kojima, you've read Cares of a Family Man, we don't need evidence of that shoved in our faces every five minutes. Which brings me on to the larger problem I have with the game, which is that for as nice as it is for Kojima to tie a relatively simple bow on a theme largely conveyed through mechanics, the presentation of that story along the way, from its writing to its acting, centres around some of the most on-the-nose, redundant, in-your-face exposition I think I might have seen in a Kojima game, and that's saying something, as character after character monologues their entire backstory, in some cases multiple times, all in service of battering you into the ground with reminders of how important it is to connect America, almost all conveyed through the same over-the-shoulder shot that, after forcing myself to listen to all of this dialogue, you should probably take as an indicator that you can safely skip over whatever Mama or Hartman have to say to you. 
It makes me think that Norman Reedus, with his gruff demeanour, is the perfect fit for this character who starts off not giving a toss about any of this nonsense, barely says a word to the holograms patting him on the head and going, there's a good boy, and yet struggles to figure out why he feels the need to keep going. Sam not saying a whole lot reads more as a legit character trait here, speaking only to those he genuinely wants to speak to, rather than a we didn't have Norman Reedus in the studio long enough situation. This is one of the benefits of creating a whole new universe rather than following up on a previously established one. We don't have any expectations of these people as lively individuals, and so there isn't that disappointment when a beloved character loses their, well, character thanks to a change in voice actor or a shift in series tone. These people have lived in this odd new world for some time. They might not fully understand it, but it's routine to them now. It's hardly like they're going to suddenly be so amazed about the fact they're in the post-apocalypse that they need to point out every little detail about how it works, right? Well, this is precisely why it feels so puzzling that they end up explaining it at you constantly anyway. Certain elements will be introduced rather subtly, like the idea that dead bodies are kept a close eye on here, that they go necro after a certain point, and need to be incinerated away from the city. Ideas that invoke curiosity and that you're expected to fill in the blanks on. They'll then immediately counter this careful world building with talk of, well this land was once like this, but now it's like this, and that's why people like you became incredibly important and this is your job that you've been doing for years. Obviously with a world so dense you have to get players up to speed on at least its fundamental rules and qualities, but surely that doesn't include multiple prolonged explanations of what a safe room is. For the vast majority of its runtime, I tended to find that of all the things that need clarifying in Death Stranding, half the stuff the characters repeatedly discuss at length doesn't warrant a fraction of the time spent on it. At so many points I found myself thinking, why are people talking to Sam like this? Why are they constantly reminding him that this is his mother? Doesn't he know this stuff? And that's only in the opening two hours when the cutscenes are at least visually interesting before most everything else is conveyed to you through holograms. As the game goes on and these exposition dumps get longer and longer, even within the cutscenes, they become as much work to deal with as the hikes themselves. Being told you need to go all the way back across the map with next to no equipment, dealing with increased timefall and BTs, is made all the more solid sorrowful, with multiple interruptions from Dead Man having a one-sided conversation about the origins of the BBs, something I was originally most curious about, but thanks to the awkwardness of its presentation, jammed into perhaps the lowest point of the game, it almost completely killed any desire to know more. Some of the subplots you come across, such as the chiral artist love story in which you prove you aren't a terrorist by wrapping up a junk merchant's girlfriend in a body bag and taking her to his outpost, are such bizarre non-sequiturs acted so terribly that all they serve to do is force you to question the fundamental rules of this world. Why do I need to carry her when I've seen her walk? Could she not just wear a hood like yours to protect from timefall so she could still use her legs? Is this all just to make a point about how preppers are illogical? And after asking myself all this for what felt like the billionth time, I resigned myself to the fact that all these questions likely have one answer. Stunt casting. For all of Kojima's intentional world building and storytelling through gameplay, it all seems to be outweighed by the idea of showing off how many pals he has. And it's in moments like this that the wider story really suffers for it. There are elements of the storytelling I enjoy, however. Despite the amount of needless mini cutscenes I found myself automatically skipping in the process, resting in a personal room is like stepping into a big box of Kojima weirdness that might get a little lost in the decidedly mundane activities you partake in outside. You've got his alcove full of little action figures, his favourite energy drink, his toys all hung up neatly on a well-lit wall, and adverts for shows he likes plastering the shower. Some might call this product placement somewhat gauche, myself included, but what Kojima game would work without being a little gauche at times? You get the feeling that Kojima chose these products to include. He wouldn't have taken this placement unless he really truly cared about all of this dumb stuff, that he sincerely wants people to drink these painstakingly rendered cans of Monster Energy. He genuinely wants people to check out this show with one of his favourite actors in it, even if the actor in question is currently in another role in this game. Speaking of which, a strange side effect of Kojima so photorealistically rendering all his friends for his big technical showcase is that after controlling 
controlling Norman Reedus for so long, experiencing him at his most vulnerable in various stages of physical and emotional distress, I found myself towards the end thinking of the character as Norman Reedus more than Sam Bridges. I felt like I knew Reedus the person better. The safe room is one of the stupidest examples of fourth wall breaking I can imagine, as Reedus pleads with you to do what he wants, silently pointing, flexing, winking at the camera and the like. Constructed from natural movements that Reedus would make during motion capture, then confusedly repeat when Kojima would enthusiastically freak out. The video, you know, I'd, like I'd take a drink of water and I'd like wipe it on my sleeve and he'd go, do it again, and roll camera. And I'm like, what is he doing? What we now have is a pristine archive of that dude what was in Boondock Saints, and it's the most peculiar thing I never thought I would want, but here we are. Reedus' confusion as to what he was getting himself into isn't limited to just him. Across seemingly the entirety of Kojima's film industry friends recruited to lend their likenesses or in some cases acting talents, there seemed to be a general haziness in the run-up to release, in terms of what they thought Death Stranding even was. Mads Mikkelsen in particular however, gives himself over to Kojima's whims so readily that the unnerving menace of his character is an absolute joy to behold, as he delivers lines like, give me back my BB, with such gravitas that you forget how wild a concept BBs actually are. It's a similar case with Troy Baker, who, possessing a more in-depth knowledge of Kojima's process having worked with him previously, lends his role a much needed flair, a flamboyance that shows just how much fun you can have with a character, even if the script is so dense with made-up sci-fi jargon. Baker's turn as Higgs is honestly a career highlight of his as far as I'm concerned. It's also these scenes with Sam facing off against Higgs or Cliff where you see Norman Reedus at his most animated as the actors bounce off each other in a way that just doesn't happen with any other characters in the game, thanks to the incredibly wooden performances from both the VAs brought on to voice the likenesses of the Hollywood directors and the actual Hollywood actors themselves, almost all of which, outside of one pretty explosive scene from Tommy Earl Jenkins at the game's conclusion, read like the aforementioned stunt casting rather than having any thought put into what they could bring to each of their roles. It makes it all the more baffling then that those genuinely fantastic performances from Baker and Mickelson are given such comparatively minuscule screen time, in favour of Leia Sadu monotonously telling you her origins and trying her damnedest to make I'm fragile but not that fragile a catchphrase and failing miserably. And similarly to how I feel a deeper connection to Norman Reedus after controlling him for so long, listening to Hartman drone on and on about chirality and extinction and his name and his heart and why his heart is weirdly shaped made me come away with genuine feelings of dislike towards Nicholas Winding Refn, and it's not even him voicing the character. But even despite all my complicated, often negative feelings about the mechanics and story, it's the fact I can type those kinds of sentences about the director of Drive lending his likeness to this unusual post-apocalyptic walking simulator sponsored by Monster that is the reason I could didn't get Death Stranding out of my head for a while. I still played it for a further 10 hours after I beat the story. Unlike The Phantom Pain though, which despite my feelings on it now, I put almost double the amount of time into my first go around, I also think that now I might be done with Death Stranding for good. I've seen a lot of talk about how this game will change the face of the medium and people will be talking about it for decades to come. Watching the trailers and seeing this curious experiment come to fruition, I wondered myself about that very possibility, and the writing I've seen come out about this game has made for some utterly fascinating reading. But now, just a couple of weeks after release and 6,000 words later, I can already feel my enthusiasm for even discussing the game diminishing, and that's something I've never been able to say about a recently released Kojima title. It's odd, because on some level this game feels made for me. I genuinely adore a lot of art that is directly confrontational with its audience, that doesn't set out to give them a gratifying experience necessarily. That said, I also wouldn't ever want to listen to 40 hours of Hijo Kaiden, for example. I don't always feel like melting my brain, I've got stuff to do. And in some ways, I do think Death Stranding is kind of the video game equivalent of harsh noise, taking one of the most rudimentary aspects of its medium, in music's case unorganised sound, in game's basic movement, and amplifying it to the point that it becomes a clunky, incomprehensible mess designed to make you uncomfortable, that can also never just sit in the background. It's endurance, and it can be, for those who choose to subject themselves to it, a worthwhile experience. There's a part of me though that thinks that the onslaught of outright antagonistic design and often unbearable dialogue and presentation mean that the only way to actually enjoy this game is to do one, maybe two deliveries a day, then stop. 
Forget about it. Go do something else, as the game would seemingly want. Go connect with the outside world. Talk to someone. Cook a meal. Climb a real hill. Your progress in the game will be glacial, but at least you'll be able to savour the reward of your Sisyphean task for a little longer before being told that you need to do it over and over again under increasingly punishing circumstances. There's also a part of me that thinks to truly get out of Death Stranding what it wants you to take away from it, you have to give yourself over to this prolonged act of self-flagellation. To me, the game is about precisely that question you will end up asking yourself of why you keep going when everything seems so fucked, and I think for maybe the first time, Kojima has found a way to effectively gamify that struggle through incredible community features that encourage direct engagement. It's just that question of why you keep going has been answered for me now. A week and a bit after first playing it, all I can think is, hooray, I did it. I made it to the end of Death Stranding. Cool, I guess. No elation, no wish to go back. All I can think is, I endured rather than I enjoyed. And sure, in a philosophical sense, that has meaning. I also feel that for how much work it does take to get to that fairly simple endpoint about carrying on, the meaning of Death Stranding is pretty hard for me to get truly excited about. So I hope you enjoyed my piece on Death Stranding. I'd like to stress this is just my opinion, and if you had a more positive experience with the game that's cool, I'm genuinely glad. I don't think this is the kind of game you can feel 100% any one way about, so hopefully you understand that I'm not wholly negative on my time with it either. I just had some issues with it that I felt it would be dishonest to ignore. I'd also like to take a minute to thank my patrons. Without your help, I would never be able to put in the time necessary to make videos like this. You make this channel possible. If you enjoy my work, maybe consider heading to patreon.com slash writing on games and pledging even a dollar or two for patron exclusive rewards. Every pledge helps more than you can possibly know and I will always be thankful for your generous support. Special thanks go to Mark B. Writing, Artyom Vitsyuk, Hebe Amori, Rob, Bryce Snyder, Tommy Carver Chaplin, David Bjork, Lucas, Dallas Keen, William Fielder, my dad, Timothy Jones, Spike Jones, The Nameless Guy, Ham Migas, Samuel Pickens, Shardfire, Anna Pimentel, Jesse Ryan, Justin's Holderness, Nicholas Ross, and Charlie Yang. And with that, this has been another episode of Writing on Games. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you next time.